thank you for coming to Cornell and thanks so much for sitting down with us um, to talk today. Uh, we, because we have this sort of academic setting, I feel like we can have a conversation where we can assume that everybody has read most of the work that you do, which is impossible because there's so much <laughs> of it. Um, but, uh, but I'm, uh, so there's a sort of general spoiler alert and we can just say it's okay to, um, I may spoil the three body trilogy in the first question. Um, so, so everybody be warned, but, um, but it's, it's a, it's a rare opportunity to have you here to just talk about this enormous body of work that you've, and it was such a wonderful talk last night. Um, on translation. But today I want to um, start by asking a little bit about time um, and uh, sort of models of time in, in different works that you've, you've worked on. Uh, you know, the Three Body Trilogy, there's a way in which it is circular and, and sort of has a return, um, a sort of reboot. Um, but most of the trilogy seems to be a story of sort of threat, progress, change, adaptation, new threat, new progress. Um, in your fiction, uh, I see a much more ambivalent, sometimes, uh, I see a much more ambivalent attitude towards um, the sort of constancy and change. So I think about Good Hunting, which we were talking mm -hmm. about yesterday, mm -hmm. the short story um, about the Huli Jing, um, uh, and the way in which there's, there's really, the, the, the revelation of those stories, that there's really no such, you can't just, you can't leave the age of magic, you can't enter the age of technology, they're always already overlapping and constantly Inter interpenetrating. And I wonder if you feel like there's a, like you have a model of progress that's different from some of the Chinese SF that you read, or um, how do you think about the sort of forward motion of history in the stories? Because they have huge sweep. Right. Um, I mean, I'm not sure I necessarily have a, uh, I can generalize about, you know, Chinese sci fi's in general. Right, um, right. I, I will say that I personally have always found it interesting to um, think about the two different models of time, time's arrow versus time cycle, mm -hmm. uh, which are very, you know, it's a very ancient um, debate uh, in Western philosophy as to which model is more reflective of the reality of the world. Um, I, I don't know if I firmly have a uh, uh, allegiance to either model specifically, um, but I, I do think that oftentimes when we dedicate ourselves to a progress model. Um, we sort of neglect the fact that um, human nature doesn't really change, in my view. And so a lot of times, problems that we solve using technology or some sort of social institution sort of resurface itself in a new form after the change, simply because human nature doesn't change. A lot of times the, the progress, or what we think of as progress, really just amplifies existing human nature. Um, and so, it solves the symptoms of certain problems, but not the root. And so they resurface in the same form. Uh, it's sort of like when we talk about, you know, dealing with oppression, I think a lot of times the, the way we tend to think about it focuses on the symptoms of oppression rather than the roots. And so uh, after the revolution, if you will, uh, it's, 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 you know, it's the same thing, the pigs become the humans. And, and it's shocking to everybody. Like, it's shocking oh, to everyone, but, yeah. but it seems to happen over and over again. Mm -hmm. I teach, I, I, when I teach undergrads sometimes, I, I say, well, you know, when you're middle aged, time's arrow no longer feels so, yes. you know, so, so attractive as a, as a model. Right. Um, the, uh, the ancientness of that question um, uh, is, is fascinating to me, and I would love to hear you draw a circle around the many different kinds of manifestations of Taoism in your work, like the um, fluxism from the Dandelion yeah. Dynasty trilogy, uh, the tide mm -hmm. in the Luke Skywalker mm -hmm. stories, uh, the the force, which is a sort of Western, is, I mean, from my perspective, it's sort of a Westernization of Taoism through yeah. the New Age movement. Um, and uh, um, I mean, it, 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 rep it repeats um, uh, so much, and also, you know, sort of the citation of of real Taoism that you do every so often. What, how do you see those interacting, or do you have a, do you feel like you have a school or a, a, a connection to Taoism that's your own? Um, um, I mean, I, I don't know if I uh, would say I have more of a connection to Taoism than to other important as 
aspects of traditional Chinese philosophy um, and thinking. I mean, Taoism obviously has always been influential in, in, in Chinese culture um, in various forms, even you know, in the heyday of Neo-Confucianism. Hmm. Taoism was always an attractive philosophy. Almost but, especially because... Yes, especially to those who are not in power. Hmm. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very old binary in traditional Chinese philosophy that when you're in power, you become a Confucian, but when you're out, um, you become a Taoist. Um, but, you know, as, there, there is a lot of, um, I think, attraction to to Taoism, just because, in some ways, I feel this emphasis on letting things go and and trying to find the patterns of nature um, and to fit into it um, is a message that feels particularly appropriate to the modern world. Uh, a lot of times, I feel. Um, our tendency to interfere um, unnecessarily, to 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 intervene uh, when we don't really understand the consequences, or when the consequences are unpredictable, mm -hmm. causes more problems than than we solve. A lot of times, um, the right thing to do, in fact, is not to manipulate and to add layers of complexity upon what is already a complex system, but to simplify, mm -hmm. to to sort of find the essence of. Um, uh, of of uh, of what the matter you're you're trying to deal with is, and then to follow that. Um, so I do put in uh, references to Taoism and types of Taoist thinking into my work. Um, and you know, you were mentioning uh, the Legends of Luke Skywalker. That was a lot of uh, a lot of fun for me because Lucas himself sort of conceived of the Force um, using a lot of. Um, Eastern philosophy, uh, Taoism and Buddhism um, as, as inspirations to sort of um, construct the religion of the force. Uh, and I always thought the whole idea of, of Luke restoring balance to the force um, is actually a, a very fundamentally Taoist idea mm -hmm. that what is, when the world is, is, is um, out of harmony, when, when the two sides, the light and the dark sides are out of, out of whack, that's when terrible things happen, but, but it's the restoring of the balance that, that, that actually is important. But I feel oftentimes that message is either lost or sort of gets misinterpreted um, in, a very, um, uh, in a very typical kind of uh, Western binary uh, model in which there is good and there is evil, and it's 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 actually the crushing of the dark side that we're yearning for, not balance. Uh, and so, in Legends of Luke Skywalker, I sort sort of try to restore, if you will, the meaning back to the way I think um, Luke has probably originally conceived of it, and certainly Taoism conceived of it. That that it's not about crushing the so-called dark side, but rather bringing balance uh, to the forces of destruction. And to visualize a place where, that is actually in balance, like the utopian mm -hmm. sort of end state, if you did restore balance, what, that would, what would that look like? What would people do? I think it has to be a dynamic state. I think one of the key points about Taoism is that there is no static state of balance. Mm -hmm. uh, when Taoists speak of balance um, in, in Taiji or in, in, in any kind of philosophical writing, they sort of conceive of uh, balance as a dynamic state of constant change, of flow, sort of the tides coming in and out, the moon waxing and waning. Um, it's, not, it's not a static place. Uh, in fact, I think, I think Taoism uh, would conceive of that kind of static um, model of, of you know, utopian um, to be impractical and impractical and, in fact, impossible to achieve. Um, it's, that's not human nature. We, we don't stay still. Um, you just have to actually embrace the change and the constant movement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. The one of the after thinking about your your talk last night and the sort of um, anti-colonial, anti-imperial position that you see translation can being able to take, um, and then realizing that the first novel of the Dandelion Dynasty trilogy is about the, uh, the, an imperial force taking over right. an entire right. um, that the. the those those moments of opposition or resistance are just moments. They're not right. Not they're not. Same. Yeah, it, I, I think if you if you end up with the model where you really are trying to crush evil and you know establish its place, you often end up with the the model of cycles of revolution where the pigs become the humans mm -hmm. because in fact. Mm -hmm that's sort of not accepting that things do change and you have to take a dynamic stance. Yeah. <coughs> I was, uh, when I was, there's a, in the book two, the, the sort of queer romance and the sort of, at the Ben Franklin moment, this wonderful 
I was uh, uh, fascinated because I found myself not just cheering for the characters, which I've, I mean, obviously I'm cheering for the characters, but also sort of cheering for the contemporary moment that there's some sort of active value that's spreading that right. is, that's right. desirable. Um, and I, for a, a moment, I mean, I, I, I study Chinese culture, but I don't affiliate with it as a um, owner of Chinese culture. But for a moment, I felt proud of the tradition of places like Cornell and other places that are trying to to, right. to sort of spread these values. Um, and I kind of got the fun of it from the perspective of the Chinese American or the Ch who feels like here's a beautiful thing about Chinese culture that the novels create because mm -hmm. it's my part of the mixture was now. Um, can can you talk a little bit about audiences? I, Sinologists who read the Dandelion Dynasty novels really like them because they're full of Easter eggs and like like the Romance of the Three Kings right. and all this stuff that we're like ah it's in there it's in right there. right right. Um, and I know that English language readers who don't have any connection with Chinese care Chinese culture like the books a lot. Um, how did you write that dual level? And I've seen you talk about it. Yeah, I mean, I, it wasn't a conscious thing. Uh, I think I wrote the novel really for uh, myself. Okay. Um, I mean, the way I sort of think about the novels is um, I don't really think of them specifically as um, uh, novels about Chinese culture. Um, the fact that they are reflective of a lot of Chinese culture is simply because that's my culture. Right. I sort of conceive of the novels as um, uh, my attempt at creating what I think of as a very uniquely American form of fantasy, which is, um, uh, I mean, this may go against uh, some contemporary ideas, but I, I really do feel that one of the unique things about American identity is the idea that it is an identity that you can actually actively adapt and and, and adapt um, for yourself um, simply through an act of of uh, of will and an act of lifelong um, uh, striving. Um, what is unique about America is a you know every nation has its own national myth, its own way of sort of telling stories about how they are unique as a people, either from all other peoples. Uh, on the planet at the same time, or historically, how they're distinct. Um, I think what is unique about the American national myth is that we do have this idea of um, taking uh, individuals who come from other cultures and other roots and to come together and create something new mm -hmm. in this land. Um, uh, I think we're somewhat unique in that we don't really go and reach back and identify a single origin for the American mm -hmm. nation. We are actually very happy to embrace the idea that we are the commingling of many different sources and that when the, when the sources come together, different they- Different thing starts. Yeah, different, they, they evolve in new directions, yeah. but they also take on that, that root and make that root into part of the American fabric. So uh, the Danton Dynasty is sort of like that in, in several ways. Um, on the one hand, it is a story about how a new people comes to be? How, 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 does, how does this nation of Dara uh, come to be? Um, you know, the first book is very much about the war, the warring origins of, of, that, of, that, um, of that nation. And then the second and third books will go on to sort of explore how the people of Dara try to create for themselves um, the, 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 the narrative of what is Dara and what does it mean to be a person of Dara um, in um, uh, both in terms of uh, how to understand their own history and how to envision themselves striding into the future. And I think that's very much a story parallel to the story uh, of America. Um, and, you know, sort of there are hints of this in the second book, but there are newcomers, people who come to right. the shores of Dara. How do they and become? And old civilizations that were there before, exactly. right? and, that and are and there, mixed with Right, them. there's no reason to do it that way unless you are, in fact, trying to tell some version of the story of America, that there are people who are, who are already here, people who are coming, and new people who are still coming. Yeah. How do you put them all together into the story mm -hmm. of Dara? Um, so that's one side of it. The other part is <clears throat> I wanted to um, tell this sort of fantasy story using um, uh, the founding of the Han Dynasty, especially the, 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 the legends around it as a kind of um, uh, historical inspiration, a, a sort of a framework around which the fantasy is spun. And that's sort of an, an unusual move. I don't think I've seen many people do it, which is to um, 
trans uh, transfigure, if you will, one national myth into another, mm -hmm. and that's what I was trying to do. Um, it's not. It's not. It's not. It's not. It doesn't. It's not intended to be some sort of um, Chinese, quote unquote, pseudo China fantasy. Sort of. I said multiple times that Dara is not meant to be magical China. And the reason for that this is this bothers some people that it's like not Chinese enough to, right, to right. like satisfy this sort of right. So I was like, to... the whole point here is to, <clears throat> in fact, not to satisfy that urge. Mm -hmm. uh, the whole point is to to say, what are some aspects of Chinese culture that I think to be particularly interesting in terms of defining the national myth, and how do you extract extrapolate those 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 elements and form them into a new national myth that may be you know interesting and, and reveal something about the way um, America functions yeah. as a, as, a, as a mythical nation. Um, and it, it the, reminds me of the Aeneid, the way that it's grafted yeah, onto the, yeah. the Iliad. And the, That's exactly right. Yeah, uh, yeah. People sometimes uh, don't give the Aeneid enough um, credit. It's it's really quite an amazing piece of work, both intercultural work. Yeah, both both, both in terms of cultural construction and in terms of political uh, purpose and, and and the scope of what they uh, what he was trying to do. Um, but you know, this is what I was trying. To, I was trying to take um, the story from one national myth and try to transfigure it into uh, a kind of uh, national myth for a different nation. Um, and, uh, you know, it's sort of reflective of, I think, the journey of a lot of immigrants um, into, into America. How do they transfigure their own national myth into and uh, make it into part of the fabric of the new nation? Um, so, you know, that's what I was trying to do. I wanted to write the story for myself. And I think um, a lot of readers sort of Get what I was doing, and that they enjoy it. Uh, but you know, it's not it's not a story that's meant for everyone, um, and and well, uh, meant for different people in different ways. I mean, yeah, that's yeah, true. Yeah, the uh, and it, 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 I get now in some ways the things that to me are just totally just totally seem like okay, that's just a Ken Leo thing. That's not. It's, it's, I can, can't reduce some sort of intercultural exactly. conversation. Exactly. The engineering of the interior of Dragon Breath seems like such a thing that is like a thing that you would do. Right. Um, right. And, and 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 is a cultural layering of, of different levels of mythology. And right. 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 Technology and um, but but it's just ends up just being your just your voice. There's no right. I I, I I enjoy that sort of thing. You know, it's sort of like um, there are long passages in the books where I sort of just go into detail about how you construct these machines and mm -hmm. how you build mm -hmm. these things and it's not critical to the story you know I put them in there because just I they're mean, kind of fun. <laughs> yes, it's like, it's, you could yes. you could technically abridge that but it's not, yes. that would be stupid. It, it's just the sort of thing that I enjoy. Uh, I mean I was telling um, some other students uh, yesterday they were asking about the process and I said you know I, I enjoy working on these novels because they sort of give me an excuse to explore um, uh, building things uh, that I wouldn't have an excuse to build otherwise. So for a lot of the machines, especially in the second book, you know, these are electric static machines, mm -hmm. engines. And so, you know, I, I, I have a theoretical um, model and understanding of how they should work, but, you know, until I actually Build some model. I can't really prove that they did work. You honestly like so I did. I, did. And, oh, I, 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 I built models. Uh, so so I built. Uh, so this is not going to show up until the third book. So I can't reveal it. But there, you know, in the second book, I talk a lot about various electric static things you can do and and how it feels to be silk shocked. Silkmatic, silk, silkmatic, silkmatic force. Silkmatic right? force. Yeah. So uh, so I you know construct a lot of these uh, laden jars and, and, and that sort of thing and, and try to actually um, you know charge them up and, and, and see how they uh, how they function um, and my my own theory was if I can get the effect that I'm describing and within you know a couple orders of magnitude in terms of power then I'm gonna argue that it will work because uh, it's fantasy engineering so if in principle it could work I'm gonna leave the refinement to you know, the fantasy engineers, <laughs> the fantasy engineers. Let them I'm just, do the work. I'm just doing the prototype. It yeah, works. Right. I'm good. Um, but uh, but but uh, I, there was one time where I charged it up and I, I tried to you know, I wanted to shock myself, sort of see how how it feels because I'm describing this effect in the book. I wanted to know how it feels. Um, and it was extremely painful, uh, and and of course you know I, I realized how dangerous it actually was because the voltages of these things can be very high. Uh, so anyway, uh, I 
I can honestly say that I know how it feels to be shocked by such things. Those were some pretty specific descriptions <laughs> so in the like, of what it felt like to be attacked right. with somatic force. Yeah. Um, and then I had to put in a reader's note that, you know, please do not do this. Try this at home. Not, right. not a good right. idea. <laughs> Kids, you know. Don't. Yeah. But 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 I did build a bunch of models for the third book, um, uh, and uh, especially for some of the, the the flying machines and also a lot of the uh, electronics because um, you know I describe circuits, um, so I had to sort of prototype and make sure that they work. So that that part was really fun. Yeah. I have a, so this question about time it relates to questions about process, and I've read I've read you describe your compositional process for the fiction is pantsing, like you just pants it. Yeah. Like you just start, you start writing page one and then you keep going. Um, the translation, I feel like, is maybe different. And I'm curious about how, because I've pantsed translations before where you just, you translate the first line and then you go to the second line and then you go yeah. back. And, and then, then you have to go back and fix, yeah. But uh, I'm wondering how, how you move through, do you prototype pieces of a translation? Do you do sections? Do you, how many times do you read before you start actually composing English? And, and how does that, because in, instead of the sort of open space that can circulate and cycle, the translation is a closed project. And right. At some point you, you just shut it off and you, right. you've, you've hit your mark or you've done your best. Or, right. So how does it, how do you do it? Um, I mean, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about composition first and then sort of compare the translation part to it. So um, the way I talk about pantsing is it's, it's a little different when I'm doing novels versus short stories. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, especially with novels or longer short fiction, um, I usually have in mind some landmarks I'm trying to get to. I don't have an exact plan, but at least I know the big landmarks. And sort of the pantsing part is where I try to figure out how to navigate to the various islands, the exact course I'm going to take. So it leaves enough unpredictability and enough uh, need to explore, to sort of figure things out on the fly, that it still keeps it exciting for me. And for, I'm hearing the structures of Ping Shu storytelling where they have a couple of plot points that they know that they're going to hit. Yeah. And they are just kind of... I, I think that's right. And I think that's actually very similar to the old um, folk uh, theater practices where, um, especially in you know places like Italy and so on, where uh, it's not that the actors actually memorize the lines exactly. Mm -hmm. They just know that there's a set of things they need to get to, and the they sort of the frames, right. the and they sort of improvise. But they they know what they're going to get to. Um, it's uh, with translation. It's uh, uh, you obviously can't do that exactly. I mean, you, you can as long as you're willing to come back and redo the earlier work and over and over again. Um, what I tend to do. Uh, for translation is to read it, I think, a couple times first um, to just get a feel for the voice again. Because um, usually these pieces are pieces that I liked in the first place. And so when I'm ready to actually work on them, I, I just reread them a couple times to get the voice in my head. Um, and then I usually try to figure out um, a set of translations for terms mm -hmm. that, you know, neologisms are a big deal in sci fi, so you have to sort of figure out a set of terms for, for these uh, uh, specific words uh, or inventions. Um, and that's kind of tricky because what kind of uh, words you invent um, will de depend a lot on the, on the piece itself and what sort of voice you're trying to project. Um, once that's done, um, I sometimes will try to do the first paragraph um, or sometimes the last paragraph to see how it feels, um, how the, the the voice I have in my head feels uh, when when it's written out. Um, if there's it doesn't, your, there's your bottle prototype electricity. Yeah, yeah, it's a little bit. Um, yeah, so, I, so so I try yeah. it out, and if if it, it feels not quite right, I, I make some adjustments. Mm -hmm. uh, but usually, usually when that's done, I I then uh, start with the knowledge that when everything is done, I'm probably going to have to go back and redo the first couple pages mm -hmm. again, because no matter what, it's kind of like any kind of uh, performing art where when you're starting, you're doing some warming up mm -hmm. and getting ready. So no matter how much I prep, I think the first couple pages always have to be redone. Mm -hmm. It's just that mm -hmm. it, you have to get into it a little bit before it flows really smoothly. So. It's, in, it's, it's fascinating to me that you, you start with those 
neologisms that and and you do this sort of technical term the difficult technical terminology first because there it strikes me that there's a rhythm of education in a science fiction story in a lot of science fiction stories that determines its experience in a certain way it's different from the narrative rhythm of plot and the rhythm of time and fictive time in the story and the rhythm of prose and it, it layers on top of these things um, and I'm and it raises a question for me about education and the role of education in both your writing and the translation. Um, uh, there's so much child teaching mm -hmm. in your work, and it and it, I didn't I didn't notice it until you said that you had written the Legends of Luke Skywalker for your daughters, mm -hmm. and I was like, yeah, that happens over and over again. That um, uh, Kunigaru um, really working on the education of his children, really worrying about it for mm -hmm. most of book, book two of the Dandelion mm -hmm. Dynasty. Um, and just this, and you, yeah, I know you've developed a, a children's educational app, and that this stuff is really, really in your mind. And I, I'm wondering, first of all, about fiction as education, and what it's good for or bad for in terms of education. And two, about translation as education, cross-cultural education, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and how you, do you see these things as having an educational purpose? Or use, even if it's not proposed. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting. I I don't, uh, I don't think fiction is um, is used for for teaching at all, actually. Uh, and then I I think fiction. I'm just I just canceled all my classes, <laughs> <laughs> literature classes. Uh, that's different. That's different. <laughs> it, teaching about fiction is quite different from writing fiction to teach. I, um, I I think I think I'm actually very leery of the idea that one should write fiction to teach at all, uh, simply because you know fiction is a different mode of rhetoric. Um, I'm very focused on, on different modes of rhetoric and what you can accomplish. I mean, one of the things about, um, one of the differences I see between um, uh, persuasive writing in, in, in an essay versus fiction is that um, in persuasive writing, what you're trying to do is to narrow the reader's interpretive freedom, uh, because the goal is to lead the reader down a specific path of argument. Mm -hmm. So the more you can prevent alternative interpretations of what you say, the more you can make the path so narrow that the reader has no choice but to follow where you go, the better. Mm -hmm. That is the very antithesis of good fiction writing. Um, good fiction writing, I think, is about constructing um, a space. Uh, house, if you will, that is large enough for readers to move in um, and find their own space. Uh, I can't remember the exact quote, but um, there there was this wonderful quote about interpretation, which is, before a piece of text can be unpacked for its meaning, the reader must actually pack it with her assumptions and interpretive frameworks. And I think it's extremely important in terms of fiction. Um, the, the, the metaphor I sort of picture is, you know, when I construct a story or a novel, I'm really constructing a very large house with many different rooms and all sorts of secret passages and um, nooks and crannies. And readers sort of come to the house and with their own baggage, mm -hmm. literally. Uh, and they come into the house uh, and they start to unpack and find a room that they find to be comfortable and then make it into their own room. Uh, I have to make my writing contain enough space in it for readers um, uh, to find uh, a room that's comfortable for them. But not all, not all houses are for everyone. You know, there are readers who come to my house and they look around, they're like, this is just not for me. You know, these are the people who can't finish the book and say, it's just not for me. And that's totally okay, because if you try to make a house that works for everyone, you end up with a house with no character at all. Um, so you have to build a house that appeals to a certain kind of reader, uh, but also leave it open enough for the reader to actually make the place their own. So I think that's that's what fiction is, is, is about. Fiction has to create a house that allows the reader to construct their own lives. Um, it, it cannot be like nonfiction or educational writing in which you are specifically leading the reader to a particular result. Um, so I don't think writing fiction with the aim of education is a good idea. But my fiction does meditate a lot about what is education and what are the ways in which we can pass on our wisdom to the next generation and why do we think that's a good thing? Um, you know, it's, um, I, I, I think there's no other species um, um, that's comparable to us in terms of how much energy we devote to education and how important it is to our very survival. Um, 
we we uh, you know as a species we we have externalized our mental um, structures and our mental contents uh, to a larger extent than almost other any other animal. Um, there's this concept uh, of extended physiology in, in biology where we sort of talk about um, quote unquote artifacts built by an animal as part of its physiology, mm -hmm. sort of, you know, the, the hive of a bee. Or That's why when you kick somebody's car, they flip out and jump out because <laughs> you just attack their body. Right, right, yes. yes. Um, uh, or the burr of a scorpion or something like that. But for humans, you know, our extended cognition, extended biology really is just everywhere. You know, you look around um, the way we don't contain all the knowledge we need in our heads. We put them in books in databases so that we can look them up if we need to. We, we, we externalize our brains. I mean, all of us are in some ways cyborgs already because we have externalized large parts of our brains. And so a lot of our lives spend on learning how to use these things and how to teach the next generation how to use this sort of wisdom and what is the most efficient way to pass this wisdom on books, classes, you know, direct brain-to-brain -brain mm -hmm. communication, what. Um, so I do write my fiction around that theme a lot because I think I find it fascinating and it's a very um, interesting part of, of cultural practice, you know, how different cultures conceive of mm -hmm. the mission of education and, and the, our debates about what is the best way to educate. There's the, that first story in Paper Menagerie about the books of yes. aliens. And yeah. it, it, I can see why that's the sort of proem of the whole collection. Yes. Because this is the externalization of your thinking and there's a, yep. you know, there's that one race that their brains etch yes. a book style brain structure and yes. then you can take that out yes. and, and reproduce it and yes. so you, this is you doing that yeah this is yeah. this is you know literally how, how that works um and uh so uh so back to the the, the education purpose of sci-fi um uh, of translation um i i do think that um a translator has some duty of 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 educating um only in the sense of if you're translating from a, a culture that you know that the target audience is not familiar with, and if you decide that the best way to handle that is to not explain at all and to let the readers figure out themselves, that is a legitimate artistic choice, but I don't believe it is always the best choice um, because that sort of choice leaves um, it up to the reader to do the interpretation. Now, in some cases, that's actually a good thing. Uh, so if you're, say, translating from, say, classical Greek um, or, or some other high prestige traditional classical language, where opening up the room of interpretation and, and giving the modern reader a sense of participatory construction, meaning construction, in the in the in the work, I think that's actually a good thing because sometimes we are too intimidated by the amount of footnotes surrounding surrounding these texts to be able to really be playful with it. You know, I think a lot more people, for example, would enjoy Moby Dick um, or Ovid um, if if these texts were not presented as sacred classics uh, to be approached only through pages of footnotes so that you can understand what is going on. So you, you must be educated before you can properly approach those works. I think that's actually harmful to the enjoyment of these works. Uh, a lot more people would enjoy Ovid and, um, and, and uh, Moby Dick if, if they didn't have to approach them this way. Um, but on the other hand, if you're translating from a contemporary culture that has low cultural prestige, and is prone to be misinterpreted or to be subjected to stereotypes, then I think you actually do have a duty to explain, uh, to, if nothing else, counteract against the reader's tendency to make assumptions that are problematic um, or harmful. Um, so, you know, in the case of, of, of me when I'm translating from uh, Chinese SF and I feel that certain things may be misunderstood, I mean, for example, right? There's uh, there's a scene in Three Body, uh, I can't remember which book, where two characters are talking about the nice guy. They're looking up at the night, and uh, and one of them looks at the Milky Way and says, it really looks like a road of milk. Um, so, you know, if I just translate directly like that, uh, I, I think there is a high probability that many uh, monolingual Anglophone readers 
will assume that in Chinese somehow the word for the Milky Way in fact yeah, is the Milky Way. Like it, yeah. Right. Uh, and and I thought, well, I, I should footnote and explain because this actually is reflective of two interesting things. One is that the word for Milky Way in Chinese is not some translation of Milky Way. And two, nonetheless, the two Chinese characters here are making this reference because they have been steeped in English education. So in that one fact, there's a bunch of interesting facts about China that I think a lot of American readers may not be aware of. One is the extent to which um, this kind of cultural submission to the West has permeated um, the society up and down such that the characters are not even going to use, they're, they're going to make, they're going to talk to each other using a reference that's completely derived from English when they're speaking Chinese. And two, uh, the, the fact that there actually is a layer behind that, that when they're talking about it looks like a way of milk, it's because they are in some way talking about how exotic that mm -hmm. phrase is to yeah, them. It's, it's alien to them, so they're right. pulling it apart. Right. right. So, so, so there's all these layers that will be lost if I don't say something. Yeah. Uh, and so I felt in that case it was important actually for me to come in and say something because I, I feel it would add to the reader's appreciation and understanding of the work in the way that, you know, they wouldn't necessarily get by just randomly plowing through. And in a, in a really subtle, maybe mm, detail way, gets across one of the great things about Chinese science culture is its, it's total borderlessness in some ways to, right. to lots of other discord from Russia, from it, it, it really is very, yeah, exactly. If you hear the way uh, Chinese writers talk about you know, their own inspirations, it really is in some ways much more cosmopolitan in some sense compared to us because we really do see ourselves as in, in the US you know as working from very specific traditions especially down from the Anglo-American right, tradition right, right, right. Um, we don't really talk very much about the Russian um, uh, body of work uh, and when we do talk about Eastern Europe we sort of talk only about one or two representatives but who are not necessarily influential in our own work it's very different in China in terms of how they conceive of their own cultural mix, mix yeah. science. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think about Yang Yang Chong's pieces and about sort of contemporary Chinese science culture. And yeah, the, yeah. Um, the science and technology universities. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it is. And so you're so that and that it's not teaching. I mean, it's teaching, but it's not. It is, but it's, teaching. it's not didactic. Yeah. I, I don't think. I mean, I think I, think I tried, the situation across. Right. right. I think I try to not lead the reader down to any specific conclusion about how they ought to think or read about something. Just sort of like. These are things you may not be aware of, mm -hmm. but that could actually change how you interpret this passage. Yeah, yeah. cool. The, um, I'm curious too about what you think. So this, and also my classes are back on now because I teach in translation a lot, and that's part of that's part of the function. But I also find myself lecturing for early students much more than I'm comfortable with. And mm -hmm. then, you know, third year, fourth year, people are directly engaging right. in the way that once they sort of break the sort of stereotype yeah. habit, and they kind of. Um, are listening. Well, I, I think I think what you're talking about is is sort of um, the part of education that I'm I'm often very interested about in my fiction. The idea of how do you teach the most important skill of all, which is how do you teach the student to have the ability to learn for themselves? Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, this is sort of like the key turn in any kind of graduate study, right? Because yeah. all the way up through, you know, I would argue the master's program. The student is still a student. It's 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 after that where they start to turn from student into a scholar. You mm -hmm. know, someone who discovers knowledge for themselves. And Lanzia you know, takes them on adventures. Yes. And you don't, and there's yes. no longer a sort of classroom oriented right, uh, right. situation. But but that, that that turn is very important. And so you know, in um, in the Dandelion Dynasty, you know, it's sort of like that's the part that Kuni obsesses over. You know, how do you get to the point where? The children are no longer listening to a master or to me, mm -hmm. but are able to discover for themselves what the right thing to do is. Um, but I think in a lot of education theories or education debates, that's the part that actually should be focused on, but we don't necessarily focus enough on. We sort of tend to focus entirely on the part about what is the best way to indoctrinate a certain set of control. knowledge in there, but we don't really worry about what is the most effective way of getting to that second stage. Yeah, because you have to give up control. It's very difficult mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to do. This education function seems like one of the things that isn't, 
that will persist for a, the foreseeable future, even as technology changes the way that we translate or changes the role of translation. And, and I know that you've, so your early maybe experiences with translation would have been paper. You can look up the radicals. And all, I mean, you're from that generation partially. Yes. And also now you've seen this, and as a computer programmer yourself, and have seen this sort of arc. Do you feel, can you feel a future for the practical nature of translation or the, the role of the translator? Can you feel what's happening in the near future? Or the well, it depends on what sort of translation you're talking about. I mean, you know, um, even now, you know, a lot of um, fundamental sort of technical stuff is done by machines. And mm -hmm. I, I don't think, uh, I think that area is well, only in large. Um, I mean, my feeling is any area of, of linguistic performance where the goal is to narrow the uh, scope of possible interpretation is subject to machine to translation, and, right? Yeah. Um, because the semantic space is, you know, intended to be narrow and small, mm -hmm. and 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 uh, they specialize in that. And precision is exactly what we want. So I think computers are great at it, and and they should. Um, so in the future, I don't think it's very unlikely. Um, uh, it's it's uh, I think it's very likely that. Um, a lot, of, a great deal of nonfiction writing will be overtaken that way. On the other hand, any sort of writing that involves narratives or some sort of deliberate ambivalence, um, I think that those are the areas where humans will probably play a pretty important role. Um, uh, but in areas where translation is is more abstract, in terms of, of uh, I'm thinking of adaptations. You know, how do you how do you translate um, a written piece of work into um, a film, a piece of film, or um, a game, or something like that? That kind of adaptation, which is really a form of translation, requires a great deal of creativity and input from the uh, the translation team. That kind of work, I think will still be done by humans uh, for as far as I can see for the foreseeable future. Um, but I, I do think it's one of those things where going forward you will see um, uh, a redivision of labor between humans and, and machines. I mean, it's not like even now human translators don't rely on a lot of machine help. I mean, I personally don't find any use for this sort of thing because what I do is almost entirely a, the second type of translation uh, where you know it's open it's narrative based and there's actually a lot of performance uh, performance artistic crafting that you have to do but I do know you know I used to actually work uh, at a company that specialized in providing software um, what's called translation memory for translators and this is for translators who work in fields where repetition and reuse of text medical, is coding, medical uh, yeah. legal, uh, uh, marketing literature, you know, yeah. where the same kind of phrases pop up over and over again. And then it does help them to have this sort of thing to allow them to consistently translate certain things the same way. Even this was, you know, a long time ago, like 20 years ago. Uh, so now that the use of that sort of thing is, uh, has only increased mm -hmm. tremendously. Mm -hmm. And related to that sort of the role of the translator, um, I'm curious about your progress narratives and your sort of experience with time. The um, I've, I've seen and uh, and maybe you mentioned people who who tell a sort of epiphany story about you where you saw Liu Cixin's book and you were like oh, science fiction right, thing, right. and like I'm 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 reborn into the into. <laughs> Uh, Xiao Liu, you know, like uh, the, the Dao Liu. Uh, right, right, brother. right. Um, uh, I'm wondering what you, how you see your, because you've done so much. I mean, we, the, a lot of students here have this sort of sense of like specialization. You get a JD, and then you have to lawyer, and then you're the better lawyer, and then you're the super lawyer, and then you, maybe you die, or maybe you don't. You go into lawyer. You almost Valhalla. certainly die. Well, I mean, I say that. almost they, only because there's a slight chance. Not all of them have felt that yet, <laughs> but, um, but the, uh, I'm, uh, you, you've, you've been a computer programmer, you've done law professionally for a long time. Yeah. Um, tr there were years where you were translating more than anything else, I think. No, actually. No, Always writing. That, that the, never happened, yeah. The, but the, so the writing came first, yeah. and the short stories came first, mm -hmm. and then hundreds, uh, hundred and something short stories mm -hmm. published, mm -hmm. and then translation as a substantial part of it. 
not like, really. But the, the it's a is substantial so amount of work. Pages. But it, it, it took me a long time to read. It, well, um, <laughs> but it was done over many years. Over many years. Yeah. Okay, so that was always. A, yeah, that was always just a thing that I could fit in with I other see. things once in a while. Yeah. Okay. Um, so do you see? Is there a direction or a sense of progress? Or are you are you floating uh, on the tide in a? Yeah, a sense, a, a sense that, of progress. It's so funny. Uh, so I don't actually see all of these activities as really significantly different from each other in some ways. Uh, so, you know, I sort of say that fundamentally, I just, I'm like many other modern people, uh, people in modern society, which is that we are, we're paid to become skilled, simple manipulators. Um, you know, in, in one of the signs of modernity is the degree to which we cease to make anything concrete. Um, a lot of our jobs are about manipulating symbols and putting them into virtual symbolic structures. We are we are engineers of symbols, if you will. Uh, that's that's really what most modern jobs are. This is the passage about the logograms as the yes. engineering tactic yes. for thinking. Yes, right? but that's actually what most of us we do. do. Yeah. yeah, and then I, I, I sort of like, you can take it as sort of a, uh, that passage as sort of a, um, uh, discussion about an idealized version of what Chinese characters are, even though I sort of made it very clear that this is not, not about Chinese, Chinese characters. characters. Uh, but I, I think it's more fruitfully understood as sort of my view of what modernity is about in terms of our own roles. Um, so in terms of my own jobs, they're all really jobs about constructing uh, machines out of symbols to follow virtual laws and rules. So for example, when you're a programmer, you are arranging symbols to create programs, which are artificial machines, virtual machines that achieve a specific purpose. Um, when you're a lawyer, you're doing the same thing. You're arranging legal concepts into contracts or pleadings um, or briefs that follow the rules of the legal system to achieve a certain result for your client um, or to persuade a decision maker to go your way, which is actually basically the same thing. Um, when you're a fiction writer, you are using the tropes and the accepted, generally agreed upon standards of good writing and, and, and constructing, again, another emotional machine to take the, the, the reader on a particular emotional journey that you believe will entertain or in some other way touch them in some way. Um, so these are all actually the same job. It's, it's just a, you're always a virtual engineer constructing symbolic machines. So I don't think they're particularly different. Um, and I, I certainly found the kind of skills required for all three to be very similar in terms of what you have to do. It's just that in one case, you're trying to please um, uh, an incorruptible uh, uh, piece of hardware to make decisions. In other cases, you're trying to please malleable human beings who uh, have different degrees of interpretive freedom. Mm -hmm. uh, with fiction writer, uh, fiction readers, they probably have the greatest degree of, of interpretive freedom. And so that's why, you know, my metaphor is less about specifically a machine to achieve a result, but rather kind of a house mm -hmm. in which you hope that they can find a home. Um, so to me, it's not really progress. It's sort of like me trying out different aspects of the same job mm -hmm. in terms of symbolic manipulation. Um, translation sort of fits into that, not as a, as a career pursuit. Um, it was never something that I wanted to pursue as a career, but it was something that I ended up undertaking almost entirely by accident um, in order to help a friend out. Uh, and once I discovered that I could actually do this, um, at the time I started doing it, there was almost no one else in the field really focusing on this sort of thing. And, you know, I sort of felt that uh, I was in a position to offer a useful service mm -hmm. to my friends to help introduce them to new readers. Uh, and so I could do that. Uh, but now that, you know, a couple, several years have passed and there seems to be much more interest in doing this sort of translation, it's great uh, because now I can sort of step away mm -hmm. from, from, from this task I undertook only, you know, in order to get them to this stage. Uh, it's sort of like, I feel like, you know, my work is done here. Uh, there's, there's enough interest in this that there are a lot of other people who will carry on this work and do translate authors and discover new people um, that, that I never would have 
Um, so, you know, I... And we saw them here. I mean, you've met, they, they come up and they say, I'm now a translator. I'm going to do this. Yeah, you know, exactly. Like the next so, generation has already started. Right. So I, 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 I've done, you know, what I needed to do. And now everybody else is, uh, is going to do, um, uh, enlarge the work and, and explore new fields. Um, and that's really cool. So last, last question. Um, what are you going to do with the time? You're going to write the next Dandelion now Dynasty Now I can novel. write, I can finish my third Dandelion Dynasty yeah. novel. I can... And the next step? Is there a... Next step, yeah. I, I'm going to do... Um, I have a bunch of ideas for uh, a new novel, which I'm very excited to get to. Uh, I mean, you know, the Dandelion Dynasty is... Um, uh, it will be bittersweet when I come to the end of it because I've spent 10 years of my life on it, and it is the biggest thing I've ever written by far. Uh, but it will be fun to move on to the next novel, which I think will be about virtual reality. Um, and uh, and uh, not, well, this, this is very typical to me. It's not about virtual reality per se, but rather about the language of virtual reality. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in how do we develop and, and how we are going to develop um, a set of tropes and techniques, uh, just as we develop the language of film for telling stories mm -hmm. on film. Well, we need to develop the language of VR for giving people experiences that are memorable um, in virtual reality. We, we don't quite have that yet. We're in the process of inventing it. And I think that process itself is going to be a really interesting story. Fascinating. Cool. Well, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thanks for talking to me. Yeah. Have a, yeah. Thanks.